Operation Barbarossa. In 1939, the Third Reich and the Soviet Union signed the Molotov-Ribbentrop Pact. Officially, it existed as a non-aggression pact, but there were secret protocols buried deep inside the document detailing how the two countries would split Eastern Europe. When Germany invaded Poland, both sides honored the pact, the USSR invaded from the east and Germany did indeed split the country in two. However, even in these early days of World War II, the Nazi high command planned to betray the pact and invade the USSR. Hitler had stated as much in his book Mein Kampf, though still Stalin ignored the warnings. Then, in November, the Soviet Union invaded Finland. Despite outnumbering the Finns, the Red Army suffered enormous losses and only made slow progress. The display of military incompetence further inspired Nazi high command to invade the USSR. With the Red Army officer corps weakened by Stalin's infamous purges, it was clear to see that despite its vastness, the Soviet Union was doomed to fall. By summer 1941, the Third Reich was in total control of Europe, bar Britain. With the DAC turning the tide in North Africa, the only option for Hitler to continue expanding his empire was eastward. Preparations for an attack began in early 1941, with many armies massing on the border. Almost 3 million soldiers, and an additional 800,000 personnel, were prepared, roughly equal in numbers to the Red Army. On the 22nd of June 1941, the order was given and the Wehrmacht crossed the border into the USSR. 3 million men, 4,000 tanks and 600,000 other vehicles poured into Soviet-occupied Poland. Only a few of these men would ever return. The weak, poorly equipped and ill-trained Soviet troops stationed on the border immediately broke under German attacks. The line was broken at all points, and the advancing German divisions faced very little resistance. Despite occupying highly defendable positions, the Red Army was routed. The Soviets were pushed out of Poland in a matter of days, with Army Group Center reaching Bialystok, Minsk by July. At Bialystok, Minsk, the Wehrmacht began a string of encirclements. These were designed to deplete Red Army numbers, whilst preserving the better trained German soldiers. At Minsk alone, the Red Army lost 420,000 men, at the cost of just 10,000 German lives. On the 25th of June, Finland declared war on the Soviet Union, seeking to retake the land it had lost in 1939. Joined by Wehrmacht Army Group Norway, the Finns began their advances on both Murmansk and Leningrad. As soon as German soldiers crossed into Russia, Stalin ordered a scorched earth policy to be put in place. Just as the Tsars had done in 1708 against the Swedish and in 1812 against Napoleon, Russia was to be burned. Before retreating, Red Army soldiers, aided by the local population, raised anything that could be used by the advancing Germans. Houses, farmland and crop fields were burned, animals were slaughtered and mutilated and railways were torn up. Before Barbarossa began, the Nazi agricultural leaders had told Hitler that the food of the USSR was needed for continued German growth. As a result, what was left of Russian and Ukrainian food production was sent back to Germany, causing the starvation of over 10 million Soviet citizens. But despite all these horrors, to begin with, the citizens of liberated countries praised German arrival. The citizens of Latvia, Lithuania, Estonia and Ukraine held street parties for the Wehrmacht for liberating them from their Russian occupiers. This warmness would soon dissipate though, as the German atrocities quickly caught up with the citizens. Einsatzgruppen followed the Wehrmacht, occupying many cities in Latvia, Lithuania and Ukraine. Eventually the deportations began too and over one-sixth of all Holocaust victims were Ukrainian. German progress carried on steadily, with German units encircling Smolensk on 27 July. Smolensk was the gateway to Moscow, the Wehrmacht was just 200 miles from the Soviet capital. The Battle of Smolensk was the second Soviet encirclement, which ended with the Soviets losing another 700,000 men, at the price of 115,000 German casualties. By the end, the road to Moscow was clear and the fall of the city seemed inevitable. 
Here, at this crucial moment, Hitler began arguing with his generals. The Wehrmacht High Command thought taking Moscow would force total Russian collapse, whilst Hitler insisted securing Leningrad and the Caucasus was more important. After convincing Guderian, the Führer's plan prevailed, though in practice the two plans would eventually lead to a worthless compromise. Heavy focus was placed on Ukraine, with German efforts to take Kiev and the Crimea. Half of Army Group Center was moved to Army Group South in order to achieve this, and thus all advances towards Moscow halted. The Wehrmacht swung south towards Kiev, encircling the city on 16 September. Just like at Minsk and Smolensk, the Soviets lost 700,000 men, the Germans just 60,000. The Wehrmacht carried on pushing into Ukraine throughout August and September, eventually reaching Kharkov on the 24th. However, as the dates display, the Wehrmacht began to suffer setbacks in Ukraine. Two months into the invasion, the Red Army was finally stabilizing, and by September, Soviet troops could muster some type of organized resistance. After a long struggle, the Wehrmacht was finally able to trap most of Soviet army group south against the Azov Sea. Despite desperate fighting, the pocket was overrun, and the beaches of the Azov Sea overflowed with Soviet prisoners. The Battle of the Azov Sea was extremely successful as the loss of 150,000 men, two-thirds of Army Group South, broke the Soviet defense in Ukraine. Within just a few weeks, Kharkov had fallen. At the same time, Army Group North revitalized its attacks towards Leningrad. Combined with Finnish support in the north, the city was quickly cut off from outside supply. As Axis units closed in, the city went into a frenzy. Militia battalions were created, Red Army divisions sent in before the pocket closed and defensive lines dug. A large amount of the population was evacuated, though just as many stayed. The stubborn defense of the Leningrad shocked the Axis attackers, causing Army Group North to falter. The assault stalled before the Germans could reach the city, causing Hitler to instead order the city to be put to siege. The siege of Leningrad began on September 9, when Hitler ordered the city be annihilated. Many Soviet relief attempts were made, but German lines proved strong, the siege would last until 1944, almost 1,000 days later. The food stock inside the city very quickly disappeared, leading to mass starvation. Ravenous Leningraders, the remaining women and the elderly trapped inside the city, resorted to cannibalism. Hundreds of thousands died of starvation, resulting in millions, yes, millions, of deaths caused by the siege. As winter came, and the temperature fell, Lake Ladoga froze over. This provided a vital route for supplies and evacuations to take place, as the thick ice was somewhat traversable by trucks. The crossing was perilous though, as the entire way trucks were exposed to the Luftwaffe. The route had to be so efficient that if the ice broke, no efforts were made to rescue anyone, there could be no waste of time. With the Leningrad front at a stalemate, the Ukrainian front losing momentum and the Russian winter coming, Hitler relented and ordered an advance on Moscow. The race was on. By October the Wehrmacht had advanced until Moscow was visible. Here, the Wehrmacht attempted one last encirclement. Two pincers were launched either side of the city, with the 3rd and 4th Panzer Army speeding ahead to cut off Moscow. But this time, the Red Army had changed. This was not the disorganized rabble that had been overran at Minsk and Smolensk, but instead a frenzied horde, galvanized by Stalin's propaganda and the act of defending their motherland's capital. Stalin had called every able-bodied male to join the defense of the city, even the women and children were out digging trenches and constructing defenses. Soon, many fortified lines had been created, and the outskirts of Moscow became a fortress. The surrounding countryside was scorched, leaving nothing but mud for the German attackers to sustain themselves on. Wehrmacht supply lines were stretched so far that some units were only at one quarter of their fighting capacity and strength. Then, in November, the cold arrived. Just as winter had defeated Napoleon, it too wreaked havoc on the Wehrmacht. Nazi high command refused to ship soldiers winter uniforms, that would be an admission that the war had lasted longer than expected. 
instead, German soldiers would have to fight in minus 40 degrees temperatures whilst wearing summer uniform. Some soldiers were able to scrap together some warm clothing, but most simply froze, often to death. If the snow and rain wasn't enough, Stalin also ordered the banks of many rivers to be flooded. Many towns were completely submerged, and the ground turned into a thick cogmire, further hindering German progress. The Wehrmacht was able to breach a few defensive lines, though with the hellscape that the land had become, combined with Soviet resistance, progress was extremely slow, and by December advances had halted completely. Moscow would not fall. The defense of Moscow was the turning point of Barbarossa. By December 1941, Stalin had been assured that Japan would not attack in Siberia, allowing him to move the troops stationed there to the west. These Siberian troops were well trained and equipped, making them far superior to their exhausted German counterparts. Practically invulnerable to the cold, in the frigid landscape of Western Russia, these soldiers were in their element. Joining these Siberian troops was a host of new equipment, manufactured by the Soviet factories that had been moved eastward during the summer. This included new T 34 tanks, as well as Katyusha rocket launchers and KV 1 heavy tanks. And so, with superiority in numbers for the first time in the war, the Soviet Union launched their long-awaited winter counterattack. Russian troops attacked with overwhelming firepower. Katyusha rocket launchers wreaked havoc on German lines, and the T-34 tanks faced little opposition from the still-working panzers. The Soviets crashed into German lines, forcing the 3rd and 4th Panzer armies to withdraw from their pincers. The counter-attack was so sweeping that Wehrmacht lines collapsed, though Hitler refused to order a withdrawal. Soon Klin fell, followed swiftly by Kaluga. When it was confirmed all hope was lost, the Wehrmacht did indeed withdraw. Stalin ordered his new soldiers ever onwards, though soon the conditions became too bad even for the Siberians. The Soviet counter-offensive eventually stalled, having pushed the Germans back 60 miles from Moscow. Operation Barbarossa ended on 7 January, when the Germans settled into winter positions. Doing so was an admission of defeat, the Wehrmacht had planned to have conquered Russia by autumn. But it was a defeat too for the USSR, it would take them over three years to kick the fascists out of their country. Casualties were enormous, so enormous in fact only rough estimates exist. The Soviets lost about 5 million soldiers, most captured during the massive encirclements. The Germans lost about 1 million plus casualties, though this is a very rough estimate. But Barbarossa was only the first year of the invasion, there was another four years of hell for the Wehrmacht and Red Army to fight through. 